to whom it may concern. First, I think I should describe the year of my birth. I was born on Thursday, April 3, 1924. I shared this birthday with acclaimed actor Marlon Brando, a fact of which I harbored much pride throughout my later years. I was told later that it was a year of great aspirations, great hopes, great dreams. On January 21, 1924, 6th Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union, passed on, leaving his clear successor, Yosef Stalin, to consolidate authority. On April 1st, Fool's Day, only two days before I was born, Adolf Hitler was sentenced to five years in Landsberg prison, however only nine months later, by December 20th, Hitler was released. Also, one of my favorite songs from youth, George Gershwin's fascinating rhythm, was released December 1st that year. History also remembers my birth year as being when hydromorphine was first developed, we may return to this part of the story later on. I turned 19 on April 3, 1943. I had served as an ensign in the U.S. Navy for exactly one year as of my birthday that year. I was what other enlisted men called a butter bar, along with all second lieutenants in the armed services. I was quite happy in that position studying under a branch officer who commanded me and a small group of other petty officers in a radar operations squadron at the Naval Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was working the radar, under a naval lieutenant, whom I'll call Mr. A, in late October that year when a whole mess of ONI, or Office of Naval Intelligence, guys rolled in dressed like the Secret Service and surrounding some pretty hush-hush bigwig scientists. It was Mr. A and I, and I'll call myself Mr. B, who were chiefly in charge of radar operations for the shipyard on Thursday, October 28, 1943, along with a handful of other young men. All of us were sworn on top secret, majestic levels to never reveal a word of what we saw, but what we saw I will never forget. That was the night of what has come to be called the USS Eldridge Radar Cloaking Project, or simply the Philadelphia Experiment. In 1955, one of our crew broke his oath of silence and contacted a UFO researcher and recently published author of The Case for the UFO, Morris K. Jessup. This was Petty Officer 3rd Class Carlos Miguel Allende, by then going by the more Americanized name, Carl Meredith Allen. We called him Mr. C and we called our group of drinking buddies the Gypsies. By 1955 Mr. C was living in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, but Mr. A and I had moved on to other parts, although we still kept in touch about once every six months by dropping each other a letter or postcard in the mail. We all knew Mr. C was having his problems, that his mind was going. He was breaking down due to the stress of wanting to reveal the secret he'd been sworn to never speak. When we heard Mr. C had contacted Mr. Jessup, we feared for the worst. We all became very paranoid and thought we were being followed closely by agents of an unknown Department of State. We did not dare to meet face to face and limited our telephone calls to random phone booths and then spoke only in coded messages. We took out a copy of Jessup's book and left notes for one another in it in the local library. This book was later commissioned to be published with our notes as the Varro edition, in a limited run of 100 copies by the Office of Naval Research, following Mr. A sending them our original in an envelope marked, Happy Easter. The Gypsies were done. Mr. A has since retired and passed on, alike old Lenin, and I had no further contact with him following the Mr. C affair in 1955 to 1957, when Mr. A gave our book over to the ONR. We did not have a falling out, nor part on amicable terms. We simply agreed it would be safest to never see each other again, and so we never did. Mr. C, well, I suppose we both kept watch on him while he was alive as well, but after the incident of his running to Jessup with his version of events, oft repeated since though only ever the product of his own fogged mind, we had no further direct contact with Mr. C at all either. I had made other plans. The Saturday following the affair with the USS Eldridge, I found my way to a local tavern where sailors and other off-base and off-duty enlistees went to drink and blow off steam. I was hoping to hear the term majestic mentioned in the crowd, then eavesdrop and insinuate my way in. My plan worked seamlessly, and I found myself in a deep discussion that night with a man who would go on to be my supervisor for the next 10 years of my life, a very wise man whom I admire very much, and whom I will simply call Mr. K. 
Mr. K was a decade my senior, a good 45 pounds heavier than me, a jovial man and well ahead of me in beers as well as years. He was running his mouth off about something called an XP-80 prototype, and immediately invited me back to his hotel room with him and a few of his Burbank, California business buddies. He assured me it wouldn't violate my oath to discuss what I'd seen with him, and he revealed he was cleared for majestic level debriefings. We sat and discussed several aspects of the Eldridge affair that had piqued my, then still young, scientific curiosity. I had seen the antenna arrays top-loaded onto the destroyer escort by night, but I didn't know what they were. Those were magnetocyclotronic toroidal Tesla ring arrays, my strange interlocutor told me. I apprised him when they were first activated I had seen two massive signals emitting from the antenna, followed by the ship's apparent disappearance from our scopes. He smiled at me in a way I would grow used to seeing him do so over the coming years, and told me to meet him at the local airport tarmac on Monday morning. I petitioned for a transfer, but went before the papers officially came through. My mysterious benefactor vouched for me with the higher-ups and, two days later I found myself on a plane to Burbank with Mr. K and his investor friends, whom I quickly found out were with the Air Tactical Service Command or ATSC of the Army Air Force. My benefactor worked for a very famous government contracting aerospace company, and he had now hired me. I began in a sub-basement as a sub-project of a sub-project. I was analyzing small model replicas of German fighter jet designs we had made by comparing a few highly classified photographs of them, using a wind tunnel Mr. K had designed and brought with him to the plant. Mr. K, although my direct supervisor, was mostly busy with the XP-80 design project for the first couple months of my working there. But once this was vetted and proved a success, he took to spending long hours down in the sub-basement with me in his old wind tunnel. We soon moved into a new facility which would later be called the Advanced Development Projects or ADP offices, just downwind of a plastic factory. The location quickly earned the name Skunk Works. I worked at the Skunk Works as a private contractor, hired on as a laboratory assistant to Mr. K and acting as an attaché on behalf of the Navy and thus ostensibly of ONI. I worked on a project involving reverse engineering of aerospace crafts, that is, we basically just made models of planes we were shown in pictures and then tested their lift and resistance in the wind tunnel. At least that was, until the end of World War II. On May 15, 1945, we received our first covert shipment of Nazi R&D crafts, the plans of Rudolf Schriever and Klaus Habermol for Haunabu planes, circular wing crafts, Victor Schauberger's repulsion engine and the Ananerba's designs for a counter-rotating motor called D-Glock, meaning the bell. We worked primarily with these models until late June 1947, when our facility became the first home to the wreckage from the Roswell UFO incident, including what we came to later refer to as EBEs, although I never saw one, alive nor dead. Some of the wreckage belonged to a U.S. Army Air Force's Project Mogul microphoned high-altitude balloon, however other components of the wreckage that I did see and later worked with were or did appear to be alien in origin. We immediately incorporated the wreckage debris data and began attempting to reverse engineer the crashed spacecraft. This was the sole purpose of our sub-project the whole time I worked at Skunk Works, until 1955 when, as I explained earlier, there was the debacle with Mr. C that led, ultimately, to the 1955 request by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, CIA, for Mr. K to work on a newly constructed location, an airbase in Groom Lake, Nevada, that would come to be called Area 51. Sadly, that was the year I left my mentor's side to deal with Mr. C and, in so doing, lost my position in the military intelligence community and my good standing as a scientific researcher therein. When I returned to my home in Burbank, I found it looted and what was worse I found it while the looters were still there. 
but I didn't find them, they found me, and gave me a stern beating for which I had to spend a short time in the hospital afterwards. I had gotten the message loud and clear, but that wasn't enough for the powers that be. The fates gave me a pomorphine for the pain during my recovery. I have been an addict ever since. While I am sure this will discredit all the rest of what I have told you, what I lived, my addiction to morphine, heroin and other opioid derivatives over the past five decades has kept me off the radar of those who would like me not to share what I know. I had almost thought they'd forgotten about me completely, when last night I noticed some of my belongings had been moved about in my house when I returned from my weekly NA meeting, even though all my doors were locked. I do not have long left in this world, and it is only my sincere desire to share what I know, what I've done, with and for the world. I thank you for your time in reading this. Goodbye. Mr. B, The Gypsy in Recovery, July 5, 2005.